Welcome everyone. This is Chaitali Bagh from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. Some words not only create awe, but also command respect. The dictionaries of the world can never unravel the enigma behind them. Two such words are going to be the topic of our discussion today. And ADU is privileged to be witness to the unraveling of the mystery behind these words, which make not only Indian Army, but the nation as a whole proud. And these two words are paracommanders. And who better than the man who has lived these two words to the hilt? ADU is extremely honored to have in its chat room, Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia, former DGMO, DG Infantry, and Colonel of the Parachute Regiment, to demystify the persona of the men who don the maroon beret. In a run up to the Indian Army Day, ADU salutes the bravest and the best soldiers of the world. Welcome, sir. And now I request editor Sangeeta Saxena to carry the discussion forward. Thank you, Chitali. Welcome, sir. This is just wonderful to have you here on the show, sir. And especially on a run up to Indian Army Day. And, uh, you know, nothing better than talking to a para commando about the para commando. And uh, I really think this will be one of the greatest discussions we've had on ADU. We are going to talk about the man who wears the maroon berry, sir. And who but you, the best man, you know, to tell us all about which happens in the life of a soldier who chooses to be a paracommando. So, sir, what are the qualities required for a paracommando? Uh, thank you, ADU. Thank you, Sangeeta. Thank you, Chetali. Uh, but first of all, clarify that uh, I'm uh, actually not a para-commando. I'm a paratrooper. I've served, uh, I've not had the privilege of serving in the commando unit. Uh, but uh, uh, besides that, uh, I've been involved in the planning, preparation, and executing special operations. I've also been very closely involved in the uh, in the conversion of 21 para SF and 2 para SF and the raising of 11 and 12 para SF. I'm a colonel regiment. I'm the director of parent and distribution of loss. So I think uh, I'll take the privilege of uh, speaking to ADU uh, on uh, uh, on paratroopers, the parachute regiment, and the para commander in the spirit behind that also. So uh, I think uh, it's a very interesting one. Uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the para special forces, though they know now the para commandos, the actual para commandos, and the paratroopers, they have a uh, aura of their own. There's, and like Chetani said, uh, mystery and uh, I've asked this question a number of times as to why do uh, such uh, you know soldiers get out together and want to do want to belong to the best uh, but so it's a very hard tough life uh, so I think uh, we are basically a bunch of misfits who fit well together uh, so you find everyone gravitating from uh, you know the infantry the armored the artillery the engineers uh, even the services, uh, AC ordinance and coming to join the Paras as volunteers versus the voluntary army. And uh, the, what you said was the uh, attributes of a, uh, you know, of a commando. I think one of the major attributes of order is a, uh, is a self-belief uh, and uh, a pride in his, uh, 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 as a soldier in himself. Uh, that's very important, self-belief, because it's not easy to uh, firstly uh, decide to opt for the, uh, uh, for the para commandos and thereafter get selected and then sustain a long service in the, uh, among the paratroopers and paracommandos. I think second attribute, he has to effective a member of the team, he has to belong, the sense of belonging. Uh, that's very important. When he has a sense of belonging, he belongs to a unit, a subunit and his team and his team members in his team take priority over him and his life. And he lives for that team, he lives for the mission because the mission is very important to him. And uh, the izzat of the unit, uh, the regiment, and that and the tag of being, uh, you know, uh, of being special, uh, really pulls him along. Uh, the third thing would be uh, his uh, physical fitness, uh, his mental robustness, and his emotional uh, well-being. Also, it's not only physical and mental that's so much, but emotional also, because uh, it's a it's a very stressful life, and uh, he has to overcome uh, a number of uh, you know very 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 hard life and. He knows no situation point. Uh, he's always in the toughest of jobs. And uh, the expectations from him will be uh, one too many by the organization. It's a very cost-effective uh, unit we are talking about, a very cost-effective option we are talking about. So I think, uh, let me just, uh, you know, uh, some of the spirit of the, uh, the, the paratroopers and the paracommando is 
uh, the, the elite, this thing, he is a Varun Bere, he, his demeanor is different, he walks differently, he talks differently, uh, he carries a swagger of his own. Uh, and uh, when you go out and someone asks you, uh, you belong to the army, you said, yes, uh, which regiment? He said, the parachute regiment. And then, you know, oh, there, there's an awe about it. Yes. And uh, that is what, uh, that's what you live for. Very true, sir. Absolutely. So, sir, we begin at the beginning that, uh, you know, when you come to the IMA and you, uh, when you're young and you have, you know, stars in your eyes, the glitter and the glamour of the olive green is great. And uh, then you have to choose a regiment for yourself and a corps for yourself. So, uh, you can choose, the, the cadet can choose. But how does the, you know, GC get selected into the uh, parachute regiment? See, uh, uh, firstly, uh, infantry uh, was not a very preferred uh, choice of arm in the earlier days. When I say earlier days, even up to, let's say, about uh, mid-2000 also. Of course, Cargill started improving. Uh, but before that, it was not a, it was not a preferred choice. And uh, we never had enough uh, para volunteers, uh, correction, infantry volunteers from the IME. Uh, or the OTA for that matter. But one thing just consistent was that the volunteers for the parachute regiment were one too many. And over the years, they have already grown. When I uh, was commissioned in 1974, we had 14 volunteers. And five were selected. Uh, it's a separate story. Three of them went on to become generals. Uh, but that is, of course, a lot of luck in it. Uh, but the fact remains uh, that uh, we, uh, the parachute regiment always had uh, volunteers by the dozens. And uh, nowadays, uh, they've been inventory volunteers and they're volunteers from the IMA. And the volunteers are one too many, actually. Uh, we have a, a problem of plenty. Uh, so before the choice of arm, um, before selection, uh, there's a, a, you know, a, a commanding officer of the, one of the battalions who's detailed, who goes there to select, uh, not uh, doesn't select, but he selects the volunteers who can volunteer. And thereafter, they're com they commissioned into the parachute regiment and they go through a provision period. So uh, this is as to the officer concerned. Similarly for the men, we have the parachute regiment training center and then we have volunteers from all arms and services coming onto the parachute. And that's what you call the lateral entry and that's for the officers also. An officer can opt up to six, seven years, eight, even eight, nine years service also officers I've seen uh, volunteering for the, uh, for the special forces, for the parachute regiment, even for the Air One battalions. So the, this is a very continuous thing. And I'll take a minute longer on this. You know, we have to understand that Indian Army is the, is the largest voluntary army in the world. And in that, this 10,000, uh, uh, you know, uh, say, uh, paratroopers who belong to the Patrick Regiment are among the volunteers from the volunteers. And we serve with mutual consent. That means I can opt out as a non-para volunteer anytime in my service, whenever I want. And the day I say I'm a non-para volunteer, I go to my parent arm or parent regiment, whatever it is. And similarly, the commanding officer of the uh, of the soldier or the officer can also say, okay, you're unfit for para duties. And thereafter, he ceases to become a para duty, goes back to his parent arm, without any effect on his career whatsoever. So that is what, uh, uh, as far as volunteer concerned, I think uh, that again, that, you know, aura of the Maroon Beret or belong to the elite, belong to the special forces, uh, something different. So that is what is what attracts actually uh, uh, young people. Uh, they want to challenge themselves basically. And, you know, it's, it's a, you have to challenge yourself to opt. And it's not easy to opt. Uh, you, I, I find so many of them say, I would like to opt. But when it comes to the uh, final thing, uh, a number of them really think twice and back out. Very true, sir. And sir, um, uh, you know, what is the probation like? What is the training like that the officer undergoes? Probation is a living hell, <laughs> to put it very bluntly. <laughs> uh, it, is, uh, it is one of the toughest things I think a, a soldier can go through. Uh, we have a provision for officers which is about four months, a month in the para center and three months thereafter in the unit. And uh, for the men, it is three months. And the selection rate is about a little less than 20%, uh, which, is, uh, which is pretty good, actually, if you look at it. And uh, in the probation, what we basically looking at is, you know, uh, 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 how do I put it? it? It's a bad one. You know, we, you want to break the will of the man when he comes to join the parachute regiment or the paracommandos or the parasif. So, uh, so you put him through a lot of uh, physical, mental, emotional stress. Uh, it's a continuous process. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, you know, you, he doesn't, you have to tell him that he doesn't have a situation point, actually. 
he doesn't have such he can perform anything he wants to perform if he has a mission he has to he has to perform and he has to perform well he has to effective on these things so uh, it is uh, uh, more of a, a, a you know not skill not knowledge based but attitude based training so you put him through uh, uh, like i said uh, put him through a living hell it's about 17 18 19 hours a day of uh, physical mental intellectual also for that matter he has to write papers he has to be do a lot of uh, speaking discussions so it is just not the physical bit you know there's a uh, misnomer that uh, you know you have to physically uh, very tough to yes you have to physically very tough but don't put it but but mental tough also medically you have to be fit you uh, if you are medically unfit within those three months of probation you are again weeded out so uh, it's a it's a process of weeding out at every stage and uh, uh, the number of uh, officers who back down after a day some back down after uh, a day prior to the three months also uh, just just a day prior to the three months so the, uh, it is uh, it's a stress uh, which is unimaginable and uh, there after selection is there and uh, like i said uh, if you go through a probation you know that you don't have a situation point but what are we looking at in probation that is that is the, that's the key issue we looking at a man uh, who is committed uh, who has uh, a pride in himself Uh, who can be a member of effective member of any team for that matter uh, who has a honesty of purpose honesty of intent uh, and he he has to have a you know a jazba uh, a, a do a die attitude uh, and he he should be you know more over that he should be mission orientation has to be there uh, not self orientation so he has to live for the unit he has to live for the mission and he has to die for the mission Very true, sir. And is the same thing true for the jawan, sir? Is his training also as tough? And uh, are they mid trainings, mid career trainings, which upgrade them to the state of the art, sir? Yes, uh, when the uh, when our uh, men come and opt for the uh, uh, for the parasail, uh, they are put through a similar uh, thing, and uh, it is very tough. Again, the selection rates are very minimal, and it is very very tough. but then the the men also volunteer from all over uh, you find them volunteering and they want to stay on because uh, they 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 like to serve in a you know they have something special in them there is a method to this madness if you ask me it is not that you know a lot of people call us mad and uh, there is a reason to it by the call us mad because you have to mad to you know it's a firstly you are joining the army that was in the army which is very tough and thereafter from the indian army you want to join the, the para and the para sf which is even tougher so th- there has to be uh, something bad about you but then the method in this badness and when the men also come and join you find them that they really want to they're desperate to uh, stay on and they really work very hard there's it's a lot of hard work they put in and uh, even they are put through you know you, uh, the, the, like i said uh, the skills have to be good the knowledge base has to be good and the attitude has to be the best and thereafter the trainability has to be there he has to be you know consistently upgrading his skills upgrading himself Uh, so that is what uh, we are looking at uh, the provisioners and the provision for the man and the officer is uh, as tough as any and it, there's no difference we made rather the officer is a little tougher than the man uh, because he does a month more and uh, we have to also look at the leadership qualities uh, not only uh, among the officers alone but even among the men the leadership quality as to there because he has to take for the small teams here these something in small teams uh, they may be have to function squads all alone and for a long period of time he has to survive and sustain uh, behind enemy lines and execute his mission so that sort of uh, 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 resilience has to be there in that man and so when we talk of leadership we always talk of leadership of officers over men but are there any soldiering lessons we learn from the jawans you know as the officers do they learn something from the jawans i think it's a continuous process uh, uh, we, we uh, i feel that uh, i have learned more from the men of my unit the men we are served with uh, than from the other officers uh, small things they will teach you they will teach you how to survive they will teach you how to do a task better uh, how to be effective and uh, how to remain focused uh, and they have a sense of humor even the worst of circumstances you find the sense of humor and when you are uh, in a in a in a fix in a, in a, in a you know when you are fixed totally and you think that things are going to go bad and then someone comes up and he has a solution for it because he, the experience of the men is not too many the small things small things are there uh, like uh, uh, i was running cross country for the first time the second lieutenant and it was a very prestigious thing because the unit was banking on the officer to lead and win 
because the men were very good and the men are all over well, but the officer matters so one of the men comes to me he says saab uh, and i say in hindi kata chappa chappa shortcut bhi mile to le lena because chappa chappa karte 16.5 km mein 1 km ho jata hai so that is a philosophy i went on to follow all my life but he also said ki agar checkpoint mein shortcut mein lena to disqualify ho jaoge so that you know that, that is the men's 80 20 rule the pareto's law uh, very, very simply explained then there is another jesse of mine you know we thought that tired troop was all about drinking you know to drink throughout the night and then go and jump in the morning and do things and uh, i was a duty officer and i went to uh, check the duty so uh, he told me he, my jesse received me and he told me what to do but in the end he says sab ek cheez not paad lena never come on duty after a drink so when everyone thinks that tired troopers are just known for you know drinking morning evening and night they have to understand that when it comes to work there is no question of being anything other than work when it comes to mission it is mission mission and mission so there are a lot of life lessons we have learned from the men and the best part is they protect you physically they protect you professionally they protect you and i have seen men trying to take the blame of things going wrong Whereas the officer should take the blame and say, "Nee, sir, I have done it. No, I have done it. How did you do it? I have done it. I am responsible." So that mere piche move, uh, there is only one leadership quality, and that is mere piche move. Follow me, you know, mere piche move, and that can only happen if you are physically and mentally skilled, skill wise also. You can perform better than your men which you lead. So you have to be a leader in all aspects of profession, in all aspects of life. and you have to fear to everyone you have to be just to everyone everyone can't be like you everyone can't be the best and you have to take the team along so i think there is lot to learn from the men uh, i think our men are the best there is no doubt about it just they just too good there is no uh, uh, there is no alternate to that they are the ones who make the indian army and by the indian army and the para sf specially successful i think it is like surgical strikes that's a very interesting one no uh, I, i think in the surgical strikes they had seven targets seven teams and seven hours seven hours of night time it was it was a zero moon 26 september a uh, zero moon and they had to infiltrate insert that is and we all know that the lc the land of control in the pakistan in the in jnk is the most heavily manned and mined sector in the world right so they have to insert stealth stealth has to maintain and thereafter they have to destroy a target where the surprise is lost and then exfiltrate into back into our own site right and was a surprise is lost you know because the, the adversary and the enemy will go after you and the chances of i thought i thought you know uh, there was uh, the so probability of success was near zero and failure was not an option for them so i, I happened to ask them later on i said why did you you know what do you ask is i was asked whether what are the chances of success i said 500% i said you know that there was success there is no probability of success actually so he said sir that was the chance we got so that is what the men said sir and there was a crazy the the, the the leaders were under pressure him to leave behind it is not who to take along the pressure was on who to leave behind it was no not to left behind so that is what we learn from the men the men will risk everything for the unit and for you when you are a good leader when they accept you as a leader absolutely true and sir uh, you know it's when it comes to war and when it comes to you know operations with other countries fine but then ci ops is a very important thing ct ops is something very important where you know our uh, para commandos and parachute regiments have been involved it does it require a special training a different training and uh, does it still keep them fit to fight a war at the borders too much uh, involvement in ct ops there been lot there has been debate about it that we are wasting our special forces uh, by applying them ct ops continuously but it is not really continuous and uh, it is also life situation training as we call it uh, they have to get battle hardened they have to be under fire and they have to prove themselves under fire under conditions of uh, operational conditions and uh, so it is also used as a uh, as a sort of a training ground uh, to to check out our uh, tactical drills to check out our ethos uh, or reinforce our ethos for the matter so i think uh, counter terrorism operations are important and uh, we do employ uh, our special forces in the crit- critical task during the counter uh, terrorist operations and if you look at it uh, they've been very successful actually uh, 
uh, historically very successful. Unfortunately, uh, as uh, the officers leave from the front, we have we have suffered uh, too many uh, officer casualties, which is uh, which is not right actually. The amount of officer casualties we suffered, I think we we have had about uh, five to six Ashoka chapters uh, uh, among the officers and all uh, in the last you know in Jammu and Kashmir and of course. Uh, in the counterterrorism operations. So, I, I, one thing which was which always bothered me as a Tanda regiment or in the regiment earlier also when I was posted in the MO was the number of officer casualties. Uh, but then that is uh, the strength and that is the weakness also in our way because the strength is that the officers lead from the front and they're always there, even after the operation of five to six men. Uh, and uh, so they, they have to be there. So, I think uh, counterterrorism operations are an important part of our. Uh, battle hardening, our life situation training. So they have to continue. But I do feel, yes, you are right in a way uh, that these have to be selective and they should be employed only in very critical missions uh, in counter-terrorism operations. Uh, we've got to preserve them. Uh, now that you know, uh, things are changing, we are going in for a proactive stance, uh, especially along the line of control and against Pakistan, the preemptive and proactive stance and punitive, even punitive operations for that matter. So they should be preserved and they already trained. They should preserve for that rather than you know, uh, attrition cost in counterterrorism operations needs to be reduced. Absolutely. And so there's one thing which always our audiences want to know. What's the difference between airborne and SF? Or are they the yeah, same they, things? No, no, they're they definitely not the same thing. Uh, they belong to the same regiment and uh, the training regime uh, is uh, uh, generally the same, but there's a lot of difference. Uh, in the way that when the airborne functions, they function, uh, they their missions are basically to operate sustained operations in a larger body behind enemy lines. Whereas the uh, special forces uh, uh, would be carrying out uh, special mission tasks, uh, diet action tasks, surveillance, reconnaissance uh, behind enemy lines, they would be operating smaller groups. Uh, so the airborne operations would be critical uh, to the uh, theater operations. Uh, because their failure would impact the theater operations. Right? Whereas the special forces, uh, their they would be uh, uh, their uh, their success of the operations would contribute to the success of theater operations, but the failure of the operations would not impact the theater operations. That's the difference. Okay. You know, it's a very cost-effective thing. You know, if if a, if a team fails, it is not going to uh, it's not going to be critical. It's not mission critical uh, to the to the operational at the operational level, the theater level. Whereas an airborne operation would be such that uh, when they are inserted as a, as a, as a body, as a battalion or as a, a battalion plus for that matter, so they would be, they would create decision dilemmas at the highest levels. If you look at 1971 war, uh, Tangail uh, was captured, the, the bridge, only bridge on the river Jamuna, and that aided the fall of Dapa. Similarly, uh, General Sagas Singh heli lift across the Meghna aided the fall of Dapa. So that is the level we are talking about. And there is a space for both, uh, for the uh, airborne and the SF. And there's actually more space for the airborne and the SF to operate together. Because if the airborne inserted deep behind enemy lines, they give a base, a pivot to the SF to operate. They, they, they enlarge their reach, both in time and space. So that is why we have one regiment, which is the parachute regiment, because we understand each other. We have similar uh, uh, techniques of insertion. And once we, if we operate together, uh, I feel that the uh, time and, in time and space, the special forces operations, which are again the contributory, you know, special forces are very cost effective. Let me show you that. And they can create havoc into the uh, minds of the, uh, uh, of the adversaries uh, by, by sheer, when they're there, they, they, you look at the amount of uh, resources which the adversary have to spend to defend. Uh, the administrative uh, laws, the command control centers, and they, uh, the airborne special forces, the best part is they're self reliant, but they're operating against second and third line troops. They're not operating against first line troops. They're already behind enemy lines. So, exactly what we've done is by employing them, we create decision dilemmas at the highest levels. So when I say highest level, means at the, 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 it is absolutely at the highest levels. The moment you employ them, uh, you have now. Change the center of gravity of the war. And so, with a changing uh, army, where the soldier is getting not only modernized but also digitized, 
uh, are our para soldiers from the parachute regiment are they uh, hardware and software savvy sir yes definitely no uh, adaptability and agility is the uh, ingrained into uh, into us so uh, very adaptable and very agile though we find uh, we always you know try to say that our soldiers are not very uh, highly educated you don't need education they are so adaptable and they can really uh, induct absorb and exploit technology uh, that's my feeling because they have to do it for a particular job it's not that they need to industry and technology the way you and edu uh, you know give out technologies and they think it is not that he he has to function with one or two weapons or adjuncts of the weapons so he is expert on that if you give him a night sight is expert on that so your sniper sight is expert on that so he will make sure that he is expert on that if you if you want to do something in the communication systems you will find that he is totally expert in communication systems so he, it is not that he will technology will exploiting he will not need to know all the best 10, 10 technologies in the world no, no he doesn't need to know that he knows his weapons and he knows his instruments and that is what technology is all about and he exploits them uh, i find the ability and the agility and the adaptability to exploit technology among our men is very high very high uh, and when we talk about technology we 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 sit in delhi and we talk about technology in a different way but he is practically on the ground he knows what to do with it and how to exploit it uh, we we do i think uh, we do need to induct more and more technology and uh, that will make us uh, more effective and also reduce the costs so uh, it is not that we have the best technology we don't have the best technologies but then 80% of the weapons are go to medium technologies uh, 80 to uh, 80% of our requirement is low to medium technologies it's only 20% critical technology we're talking about that the strategic level and that some experts are taking you know they they taking care of it and so you know the, now as we move towards the end of our uh, you know chat i just wanted to understand from you what is the story behind red devil sir is there a story behind i we've heard so much about it oh yes uh, you know we we uh, 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 world over the pair of us uh, you know they they left it together and they come together and were mutual respect for each other and uh, you know the red devils of the first name given to it in june 1940 but this in church and when, when they decide to raise uh, the first lot of uh, paratroopers uh, so they gave it the, he he was the one the best church in second world war in june 1940 uh, he said uh, well the red devils the red devils came to be known because the maroon beret the maroon beret is typical of the paratroopers the world uh, maroon beret is one of the paratroopers and that is something we all live for uh, the most prized uh, possession of any paratrooper is the maroon beret uh, because that is something he really you know and i i have uh, two of them uh, which are second world war vintage and i still preserve them uh, they you know they congols uh, they were manufactured in 1944 it is written out that congol 1944 which the factory is closed now uh, i still have them and uh, i i wanted to present one to one of the museums which 33 core which i commanded uh, they make me so once the, the museum comes out then one got them So uh, what you uh, find is the uh, Red Devils name came because of uh, Winston Churchill's people called them Screeching Eagles, Retired Troopers, and whatever names we had. But Red Devils continue to stay uh, for uh, and donate the Retired Troops. And sir, uh, what are Retired traditions sir, in India? Well, the Retired traditions are uh, one to many, and uh, uh, well, uh, uh, the tradition is. Uh, You know, like I said, there's a method in the madness. You drink throughout the night, and you go and jump in the morning. Uh, that's a tradition. Uh, you are given tasks uh, which you need to perform, which others can't even think is a task. Uh, eating glass is one of the traditions. So you, you need to eat glass. Glass is like uh, upper. Uh, you just chew it. It's very uh, difficult for right now to. for people who don't do it but it's quite easy otherwise because it becomes a part of you there there many traditions you know and the traditions uh, include doing anything that is odd anything that is difficult and also anything that is show off no? we, we are basically we, we people we 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 need our need affiliation is very high we need to respect it when the people we need to be different so we we are show offs now the vanity is very important to us uh, we, we need to be different and we need to tell people that we are different Uh, we'll go uh, at times you know uh, pick up fights where it's not really required to pick up fights uh, uh, what you call in the army take panga with the uh, on course instruction uh, so or do all the wrong things right uh, but doing all the wrong things right also is a as uh, part of our tradition 
Thanks. Uh, and sir, uh, you know, now as, uh, you know, a para, a para, you know, you've lived and breathed uh, paras all your life. And even post-retirement, I'm sure, you know, I see that the sort of energy and the sort of, you know, camaraderie which is there, it's uh, very, very, uh, you know, it's just uh, beyond compare. So, sir, what, what is a wish list you have for, for your future generations of paratroopers? I think uh, one of the, uh, among the paratroopers, the most important, uh, I would say the most critical resource is the human resource. Uh, that, that, uh, that cannot be you know, there can be no two, two ways about it. The human resource continues to be the most important resource. And that is our strength, basically. You know, 1.2 million army, and we take just 10,000 volunteers out of that. And we have no dearth of volunteers in the men, among the officers. And the human resource uh, needs to be harnessed, needs to be selected properly, and needs to be taken care of uh, by the system. Uh, that human resource is, uh, I think, extremely important. As for the material concern, yes, uh, there is an ever-growing demand for uh, newer newer weapons, uh, as the uh, as they are called newer toys. Uh, whether it is the weaponry, uh, we need the lightweight, we need uh, accuracy, we need reliability, uh, and we need uh, fully loaded uh, weaponry. Actually, uh, we are getting uh, some of the best, uh, but then there is the, this uh, demand. When we get the weaponry, something better comes up, and we are always looking for the better ones. Uh, whether it is sniper rifle, the assault rifle, whether it is explosives, the detonators, uh, your charges, uh, then insertion techniques. I think insertion techniques is something because the main, the primary task uh, of the SF and the Paras is to operate behind enemy lines, uh, and especially the SF because they need to insert on foot, they need to insert on vehicles, they insert, insert on underwater, they do, uh, so, uh, over water uh, in the seas, uh, and also uh, by air. Uh, so we have to keep giving them the best way with all to insert uh, uh, in a very, uh, what would you say, in a safe manner. Because insertion is the most difficult part of it. Once you insert, thereafter the exfiltration or the insertion becomes the most difficult part of it. Uh, but once you are there, thereafter things are, we are trained to do, carry out the missions. So we will need radar, surveillance equipment, communication equipment, medical facilities, medical equipment actually because you, you, you uh, unlike the army the rest of the army you have no support system everything is within the, within that small body of troops you are functioning with whether you want medical whether you want communication whether you want technology whether you want power packs power packs are a very major thing I, I, I can't be running around for power packs so uh, I need power packs which are you know which last longer and which are reliable uh, so there's no end to uh, I need body protection lightweight body protection uh, in all spheres, uh, NPC clothing, uh, in, 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 you know, nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare kind of thing. So the, these are things that like mobility. I, I need battlefield mobility. I need tactical mobility. I need strategic mobility. So it is not the mobility only in terms of uh, what we call the battlefield mobility. I need tactical mobility also. I need operational mobility and strategic mobility to insert. If I want to move up uh, uh, special forces from one particular theater to another theater, I should be able to move them seamlessly in the shortest possible time. Because I need to employ them. The timing is very critical of the employment. So these are, uh, I think, some of the things uh, we need. Even in training, we need wind tunnels. Uh, fortunately, wind tunnels started coming in now. We've been hankering for the last 20 years. Things are moving. Things uh, are positive now. Uh, because wind tunnel cuts down the training time. It is better training. We need simulators. Uh, so uh, the wish list is one to uh, one to long from the start. Uh, even uh, if you find the, you know, the Army Day, uh, the, the new digital... Uh, Camouflage dress, which is the uniform, which has come up, uh, is going to be demonstrated by the para troop para contingent first. So uh, I suppose the priority is there. Uh, the armed forces and the army, in particular, uh, are looking after the uh, para troops and the para SF, which is a very good sign, very good indicator. Thank you very much, sir. It was so enlightening and so wonderful to be speaking to you and getting to unravel the mystery behind the maroon beret and the men who are there in them. And, uh, you know, I think you've really made it so nice and simple for us and our audience that I am really grateful, sir. So wish you a very happy Army Day in advance. And, uh, you know, we are just hoping that uh, as and when things improve and things become better, you know, we have a whole lot of veterans from the Parachute Regiment who are there standing behind the soldiers on the field. And I'm sure, you know, they are the biggest strength 
any any army and any uh, nation can have. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you very much. Jai Hind and as the parallel of the Chhatri Mata Ki Jai. Thank you very much, sir. Jai Hind, sir. Jai. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. It has been a pleasure listening to you as usual. And uh, have a great day ahead. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you, you Chitali. Right.